When you think of the RTX 5070, chances are your mind jumps straight to the Founders Edition. It's clean, compact, and surprisingly capable given its MSRP roots. But as is always the case with Nvidia's own cards, actually getting your hands on one is another story entirely. Availability has been an ongoing nightmare, with drops vanishing in seconds or just never appearing at all depending on your region. And that's where this card comes in. This is the Inno3D RTX 5070 X2. It's an MSRP based model, which means it's aiming to deliver that same Founders Edition performance, just in a more widely accessible package. There's no factory overclock here, no bells and whistles, just a solid, no nonsense 5070 that's meant to fill the gap for those who want reference performance without having to fight the queue for a Founders card. In that sense, the X2's biggest selling point isn't performance, it's frankly availability. Sadly, availability alone isn't enough to make a card worth buying. So let's take a look at what Inno3D have done here to make the X2 stand on its own. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. This sucks. I wish I had an upgrade. <laughs> you have summoned the gaming genie. What is your wish? Better gear for an upgrade? Your wish is my command. Zone Elite XL Mat, smooth, comfortable, spill resistant, and the sleek zone mat for precision gaming. NZXT Function Elite Mini TKL, magnetic switches, compact and precise. Featuring per key adjustable actuation with 40 points of sensitivity, ranging from 0.6mm to 4mm to fit your individual needs. Lift Elite Wireless Mouse, lightweight, responsive, and ultra fast. Capsule Elite Mic, pro quality audio, crystal clear, every game chat will be flawless. Genie approved upgrades. Make your gaming wishes come true with NZXT. Find out more by clicking the link in the description below. Now, as always, before we jump into the card, I, as a reviewer, have to be honest. You may be able to get this card for the MSRP price of $549, or around £529. Though, as we've already seen, the street pricing is sometimes well over $600, or £600. So it doesn't really mean much. And instead of me focusing on price, I'd invite you to go and look at current pricing at the time that you're looking to buy it, and see if you think it aligns with how much hard-earned cash you want to part with. Also, as our day one launch review stated, the 5070 doesn't offer enough over the generation before, unless you're all about multi-frame generation technology, but I guess could be a worthy upgrade if you're on something a little older. That aside, if your heart is set on owning an RTX 5070, it would be wise to know everything about the various models, including the X2 from Inno. Now, visually, it's pretty understated. You've got a matte black shroud with two fans up front, hence the X2 naming, and a small silver accent across the middle that breaks up the monotony without drawing too much attention and ends up looking, well, quite industrious in style, especially with the screws lending to its kind of mechanical styling. There's no RGB, no flashy lighting effects, and no over-designed cutouts. It's very utilitarian in some ways and well that's its strength it's not trying to be a showpiece it's trying to be a card that just works and for i guess in the grand scheme of things an affordable price the fans on the card don't really give you a huge amount to talk about there's two of them with inno 3d branding and they incorporate a surrounding frame which is meant to give quieter operation and push more airflow through the heatsink Again, there's no gimmicks here, no specialist angled blades or a fan that spins in the opposite direction, just a simple clean design that is meant to do the trick, though we'll find out soon if that is actually the case. Now if you are wanting a bit more cooling performance though, besides this model which comes in the colour that we have here, along with an OC variant in either black or white, Inno do actually make an X3 model, which, as you probably guessed, includes three fans, but you will be expected to pay a little bit more for it, along with it also coming pre-factory overclocked. Now physically, this is, I guess, a compact card by modern standards, measuring in at just 250 mil in length, 116 millimeters tall, and 41 millimeters thick. It's essentially a dual slot card, which is refreshing to see when so many models keep growing in size for, well, what feels like no real reason. It'll fit in pretty much any mid-tower case without issue, and even smaller form factor builds should have no trouble accommodating it, especially since the cooler doesn't overhang or add unnecessary bulk. It's also very similar in size to a Founders card. So again, if you had your eyes set on that, then there's no unnecessary surprises here. Weight-wise, it comes in a smidge over a thousand grams, and because it's so light, you won't find any brackets or stands to prop it up, as they simply just aren't needed. And well, that is likely one aspect as to why this is able to hit MSRP. Again, 
no frills, just a card that has a job to do for a set price. Along the top, it's, well, pretty standard. And if you've seen an X2 card before on other 50 series from Inno, then this won't look all that dissimilar. It continues with the industrious styling and we get our first glimpse of the heatsink, which is essentially split into three parts and connected by heat pipes. We also get some Inno 3D and GeForce branding, but again, this is simple and fits in with the look with no light up logos or RGB. Now on a card like this, I actually prefer that. Now, we also get a few more screws, which I guess a lot of brands would attempt to hide, but on this, it again works with the design that they've gone for and just, well, doesn't look out of place. There's also our single 12 volt 2x6 connector, which feeds the card its 250 watts, which matches the Founders Edition card at the same wattage. For those with an older power supply, as you probably guessed, a dual 8 pin to 12 volt 2x6 connector does come bundled in the box as well. Now around the back, there's a full length metal backplate that does help with rigidity and a bit of passive heat dissipation, though it's pretty plain overall. But again, the X2 isn't here to compete on looks. It's a functional design kind of aimed at price conscious buyers who want a simple GPU that fits the bill. Of course, like most cards on the market, there is a large cutout that again gives us another glimpse of that heatsink. But instead of just being a big wide open hole, it does have some stylistic elements to it and is functional at the same time. It also wraps on the end of the card, so you do kind of see this, I guess, harmonious flow where the backplate meets into the front shroud. For the I.O., it's the standard NVIDIA layout with three display ports and one HDMI, along with some extra ventilation for helping with heat dissipation. This also means, as mentioned earlier, the card only takes up two physical slots in your case, which again could actually be vital for those with smaller form factor build cases where, well, you only actually have two physical slots available in the first place. Now, taking the card apart has, well, always been pretty easy with the X2 lineup as well, nothing is hidden. And instead, due to the styling, you can pretty much see everything on display with the main screws holding things together on the backplate as this essentially clamps the cooler onto the PCB. Now, as mentioned, the heatsink is split into three sections that spans past the PCB, which is, well, much smaller. There's also a plate that makes direct contact with the GPU core, the memory ICs, and some of the circuitry, while another plate, which sits slightly lower, makes contact with the bulk of the phases. There's a total of six heat pipes, which span one end to the other, and they do pass through the cold plate, which makes, again, direct contact with the GPU core for the very best heat dispersion. The back plate also aids in cooling and, well, isn't just there for looks, as it comes included with four heat pads, one for the rear of the bulk of the phases and three for the rear of the memory ICs. Though what's interesting is that the topmost pad doesn't really do anything as, well, there's no memory chips here. So I can only assume that it's the same back plate as what's used on other models where maybe 16 gig of VRAM is in place instead of just 12 gig like we have on this card. Now, as I alluded to earlier, the PCB is much smaller than the heatsink at just 144 millimeters long. And this is a pretty common trend with all 50 series cards where they're able to condense things onto the PCB, but a much larger cooler is potentially needed to draw that heat away from well, such a small area. The VM circuitry comprises of a nine plus three phase design comprising of Alpha and Omega Z5311 NQI-04 Dr. Moss chips and are rated at 55 amp each for both the GPU and the memory phases. And they're both handled by Alpha and Omega Z73004 CQI multi-phase buck controllers. For the memory, there are a total of six GDDR7 modules on the front of the PCB, surrounding the bottom and right side of the GPU. Though, as mentioned, there is room for two more above the GPU, potentially carving the way for maybe another GPU with more VRAM, maybe a 5070 Super that's kind of already been rumored. For the thermal paste, Inno has gone for Dow Corning 5852 due to its high thermal conductivity and low thermal resistance and is well, specifically made for GPU applications. Now, being a stock clocked card and not being pre-overclocked, we do see the same 2325 MHz base clock and 2512 MHz boost clock right out of the box, matching that of the Founders card from Nvidia. So again, no surprises and you can see directly how it can compete. As always, though, it is always, I guess, interesting to see how far things can be pushed manually. And for us, with no adjustments to the power limit, as it is locked in place by NO3D, we were able to increase the clock speed by a modest 100 megahertz, and then the memory by its maximum 375 megahertz, or 3000 megahertz effective speed. In all honesty, we do have some other cards that were able to be pushed further, but, well, free boost is free boost. Though with NVIDIA, this doesn't always translate to, I guess, the equivalent in terms of raw frame rates. Though our benchmarks will show what that means anyway, and we will be looking at them very, very shortly. 
To see how things performed across this sustained level of load, we booted up F124 for an hour long loop. And it's here where we see the Inno card managing to find itself running pretty conservatively with a GPU temperature averaging around 67 degrees and the same for the memory. This was all achieved while the fans hit around 2000 RPM, which is on the high side compared to what we're used to seeing. But for context, this is actually 400 RPM lower than the Founders Edition and therefore quieter too. Power wise, we did see peaks at around 224 watts, so well under the 250 watt TDP of the card. And again, for context, this does mean it draws around eight watts more than the Founders model did in the same test. But at such a small margin, that's neither here nor there. Going back into F1 with our overclock applied and not all too much changed. The temperatures on both the GPU and the memory increased by a single degree, though this does fall within margin of error, while the fan speed actually decreased slightly, but nothing of significance. Power wise, we did see a small increase on average of around four watts, bringing it up to around the 228 watt mark. So overall, if this gives us some net gains in games, I'd be inclined to keep that overclock in place. Moving over to see what this all means in gaming performance, and we put the card for a small selection of games to see how things compare. Starting things off with a Plague Tale Requiem at 1440p, and we find that right off the bat, things aren't looking, well, all that amazing, with 3% slower performance compared to the Founders Edition, though this does only equate to 3 FPS, which isn't really all that bad in practice. Overclocking the GPU does make things a bit better with the X2 now seeing single performance improvements over the Founders card. And whilst this does only make up a single frame per second difference, it is at least now on par. Not that it was really that far behind anyway. Black Myth Wukong is next and here we find the Inno card seeing some better performance with an identical average to the Founders Edition and only 3 FPS lower in the lows. But this does equate to 5%, so it's hard to say whether this is margin of error or not as it's, well, right on the cusp. Regardless, you're not really going to notice it anyway, so take from that what you will. But when overclocked, we do see a pretty hefty performance jump with 6% higher average performance than we saw at stock, with lows now matching what we saw from the Founders Edition at stock. So at least that overclock is, well, doing its job. Our final game is Cyberpunk, and here we find the Inno 3D card now actually performing better than the Founders Edition at stock with 2 FPS or 2% more frames on average, and with 3 frames per second more performance in the lows. Overclocking does more for the card as we see a pretty significant 5% jump in performance with four frames per second more than we saw from our stock results. And this then means it comes in five FPS faster in terms of the lows as well. Of course though, gaming isn't the only part of the story and we do need to consider how temperatures come into play. And whilst we have compared the cards already in F1, it's also worth sticking our peak temperatures into a chart to get a clearer comparison now that we have our gaming performance to contrast it with. With that in mind, when we take a look at the results, we can see that the Inno card comes in with a lower temperature than the Founders Edition when running at stock, with four degrees less on the GPU core and five less on the memory. Interestingly though, we do also happen to see that the overclock result comes in with cooler temperatures overall when compared to the stock performance. Even though it's only by a single degree, this does indicate that the fans are doing their job. As with the higher power draw and higher temperatures of the card, the cooler is able to keep up and keep things running smoothly. So to round things off, as I said throughout, the Inno 3D RTX 5070 X2 might not be the flashiest card on the market, but it absolutely delivers on its promise, providing a readily available, no-nonsense RTX 5070 experience. This card is built for the gamer who values reliable performance and a compact functional design over an RGB spectacle, making it a strong contender if you're aiming for a clean, understated build, or simply can't get your hands on a Founders Edition. What's clear to see is that Inno3D have focused on delivering a solid card that gets a job done without unnecessary frills, and in many ways, that is its biggest strength. When it comes to gaming performance, the X2 largely mirrors the Founders Edition, hitting similar frame rates across most titles. While we saw some minor dips in performance in a couple of games, these were often within margin of error and wouldn't be noticeable in real-world gameplay anyway. What's more, our manual overclock proved that well, there's definitely some untapped potential here, allowing the X2 to not only match, but sometimes even surpass the Founders Edition's performance. And well, who doesn't love free performance? In terms of cooling, the card does a good job, especially considering its compact size and dual fan setup. It ran cooler than the Founders Edition, and it also remained quieter with lower fan speeds. Interestingly, our overclock results actually saw an improvement in thermals, bringing it kind of just a little bit better, but that could all be down to, yeah, I guess the cooler having more headroom to work with when pushed and where it manages to do so without becoming overly loud. And I'm actually now more interested than ever to see what the triple fan model can do, because yeah, there's quite a lot of variables there. Now, 
the big part, obviously, let's talk about price. The X2 is positioned as an MSRP-based model, designed to be that accessible alternative to a Founders Edition, as I mentioned. And while real-world street pricing can sometimes fluctuate above MSRP, it's clear that Inno has cut costs where it makes sense, like emitting RGB or extensive factory overclocks, to, well, deliver a card that aims for that sweet spot of value and availability. The 5070 itself is a strong upgrade for those on older hardware, Oh, if you're rocking a 40 series, I stick by what I said originally, in that well, there's not much here for you. That aside, the X2 does offer a compelling way to get into that performance tier without the struggle for Founders Edition stock. If you are, I guess, on something much older and you just want to move into the present day in terms of levels of performance and, of course, features. Ultimately, if you're looking for an RTX 5070 that is readily available, offers Founders Edition level performance and just well, won't break the bank with unnecessary features, then yeah, I think the X2 is a fantastic option. It might not be the flashiest, but its compact design, solid performance, and quiet operation make it a very practical choice for a wide range of PC builds. And this is something that we see time and time again within O3D, though I do wish they were available in, I guess, broader markets across the world. But who knows what the future holds. So there you have it. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do, we've got our Patreon where you can support what we do while getting access to some really cool extras, including behind the scenes content, a super special area on our Discord, and much, much more. The link is as always down below. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.